Chapter six of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Folwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy. Chapter Six: The Picnic at Spruce Island. Yo ho, ye Sunset Islanders! Called a voice from the doorway of the bungalow, and there stood the captain from Isola Bella, the note in his hand. Oh, Benton! you're not going to take me home cried miriam watching mrs remington's face anxiously as she opened the letter no indeed miriam it is an invitation said mrs remington listen my children and you shall hear of a picnic planned on spruce island for to-morrow if the day is fine uncle bill says that the tide will not be quite right high in the middle of the day and ebb all afternoon but we can all go down in the launch oh that will be great cried paul i think uncle bill's a brick exclaimed billy if there's a cap full of wind i'm going to sail down mother and add to my mileage for the sailing coup added fred quick to take advantage of such a good opportunity suppose you can't sail back asked elizabeth then we can be towed back if the worst comes to the worst who wants to sail with me said fred so many replied that they had to draw lots with slips of paper and paul and dudley won the prize oh won't that be fine cried paul dancing about with a winning slip of paper waving over his head hurrah i got a winner too you'll let me help sail her won't you fred begged dudley well i'll let you learn if you'll do just as i say replied fred doubtfully cross my heart i will said dudley solemnly oh i don't care if you do sail dud cause benton's going to let me steer the zeus bragged billy nonchalantly yes sonny i'm going to prepare you for that launch you told me you wanted to buy agreed the captain with whom billy was a great favourite mrs remington smiled at the captain's reference to the phantom launch of billy's and handed benton a note of acceptance for the picnic as the captain backed to the door of the bungalow he remarked in farewell i must be going across the bay now to take an invitation to your uncle and aunt i suppose mrs charlton will take me back home with her tonight, so i may as well be packing my suitcase grumbled trixie dolefully yes i suppose so i believe mrs charlton has planned a motor trip for you added mrs remington i wish trixie could stay with us all summer mother sighed elizabeth well we must have her over again very soon dear replied mrs remington oh i wish you would but i ought to have a better camp outfit my check shirt is the only suitable article i really have for the boat or outdoor fun said trixie the entire party trooped down to see captain benton off and while he embarked the supper bell rang from the bungalow doorway then there was a race on the course from the float stage to the table as usual when it was a question of eating paul came in first that evening the moonlight was so beautiful that fred proposed a row around the island everybody accepted without hesitation and the two boats were soon gliding through the water in the silvery track of the moon the merry voices of the young singers in the party sounded far over the calm bay and roused uncle bill's mastiff no doubt the dog heard and recognised the voices of his little pals of the island the baying of nelson then brought the plaintive bar bars of the sheep on Arlesborough and blended musically with the singing say let's call to nels suggested billy about to whistle when miriam quickly stopped him no no nelson will surely try to swim over to join us you know cried miriam did nels ever swim as far as this asked paul you bet he did the old rascal laughed billy 
it was one day when mamma and all of us from isla bella came to a picnic over here and nelson was left alone after he hunted everywhere for some one to share his watch he decided to follow after us we had all gone to the south end when we heard a crashing through the bushes back of us and there stood old nels all in too from the long swim in the icy water exclaimed miriam gee whiz nelson ought to have a grand coup for that laughed dudley well that's why papa doesn't want him to try it again added miriam seriously why because he won a grand coup teased billy oh you know what i mean retorted miriam while the others laughed merrily doesn't the tide make the island a lot bigger when it is low remarked paul looking curiously at the shoreline yes it adds an acre or two to the area replied fred do you think the sky looks as if it would be a clear day for the picnic now asked dudley anxiously peering at a cloud as large as his hand sure thing but i think we ought to get back to camp and go to bed so we can get up bright and early advised fred so without further demur the boats were turned toward the float and the islanders were soon climbing the path to the tents early in the morning came a clarion call that hastened the toilettes of the occupants of tents and bungalow rouse ye britons rouse ye slaves billy sprang out of bed and waved his hand in token of obedience as he saw his mother stand calling through the megaphone hurry up now we've got a lot to do before we're ready for the picnic advised fred pulling paul out of his cot breakfast was a hurried meal that morning as every one was busily engaged in getting everything needed to make the picnic at spruce island a success elizabeth and fred were packing the big hamper with good things while billy and dudley were helping mose and mrs remington the wheelbarrow had been loaded three times and the picnic stuff transported from the commissary department of the bungalow to the float stage before all was ready and waiting for the boat at the last moment mrs remington saw edith standing looking about for any forgotten item suddenly she called to the child oh edith don't forget the nature books you know spruce island is rich in specimens of wild flowers and you woodcrafters will want to complete your lists of fifty varieties oh i almost forgot that and i only have twenty more to get for my coup for wild flowers cried edith running indoors anna are you quite sure we packed enough sandwiches asked mrs remington turning to the governess as she came from the house anna laughed if the heaped up loads i saw taken by slow freight via the wheelbarrow route a few moments ago are all eatables i should say we could feed the starving belgians for a week at least oh well anna you know how our children eat and then there will be the rosemary folks and all of the isola bella people too reminded mrs remington seriously even so won't they bring hampers returned anna well aunt miriam is bringing a large freezer of ice cream and aunt edith said she would bake two large cakes but i haven't the slightest idea of what else they may bring judging from past picnics i should guarantee that each one of the three families will take enough to last all summer remarked anna smilingly maybe but it is also a fact that not a crumb is ever found to carry back home or throw to the fish at this moment fred appeared on the scene with a plan mother paul and dud and i want to sail to the island in the dory you see i want to win my sailing coup for one hundred and fifty miles this summer and this opportunity is a good one but the tide is against you fred objected his mother that won't matter so much as there is a nice stiff breeze from the northwest and the boys have agreed to be good well all right then complied his mother by ten thirty the boys had started and the others were all ready and waiting impatiently for the first peep at the zeus which was to take them to spruce island what a boat full and still more to come laughed billy as he watched captain benton carefully manipulate the zeus to bring it alongside the float why where's aunt miriam and uncle bill cried edith missing them from the group in the zeus the ice cream was not quite finished and so papa sent me to ask the captain to stop again for them on the way down 
exclaimed Miriam. Captain Ed had just started the power dory that was to carry the commissary and Mose to Spruce Island, when Billy, watching, gave vent to a loud sigh. What's troubling you, Sonny? asked the captain. Ah, gee, I wish I had a launch and you know as well as I where there's a peach I could get a bargain. Maybe if you're a good boy, something will happen about the time of your birthday hinted mrs remington oh mother i'd be willing to go without my allowance and add all my christmas money to it too if i could have that launch now exclaimed billy eagerly well never mind now but try to behave and earn the launch that way advised his mother arrived at isola bella the mariners found uncle bill making a great to-do about moving the heavy ice cream freezer over on the wharf aunt miriam and two lady visitors stood giving him superfluous advice as he did things his own way after all after the freezer was safely shipped a large hamper of goodies followed and then the ladies were assisted aboard hurrah we're off at last cried uncle bill as they rounded the south end of isola bella and i can see the orion with all on board blow the whistle billy and salute them added mrs remington an answering whistle came from uncle tom and soon his launch carrying the second party slipped along after the zeus on its way to spruce island how about a shanty shouted uncle bill he had been very quiet for at least two minutes without a second's delay billy started up and the rest joined in the song i'm bound away this very day away you rio i'm bound away this very day and i'm bound for the rio grande and oh rio away you rio i'm bound away this very day and i'm bound for the rio grande by the time this swinging song was concluded uncle tom started one from the orion and the passengers of the zeus joined in flying fish sailor i'm a flying fish sailor bound down from hong kong blow 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 the man down i'm a flying fish sailor bound down from hong kong give us a chance to blow the man down blow the man up to me blow the man down blow 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 him around blow bullies blow blow the man down give a chance to blow the man down having arrived at spruce island a brigade was formed to carry boxes hampers and wraps from the boats to the picnic spot in the shade of a clump of firs the young element in the party wanted to start at once on an exploration of the island which contained nearly two hundred acres thickly wooded with fir trees and white birch overhanging the rocky bluffs of the shore see here boys if you go alone on this quest you must promise to stick together we have never been all over the island and there may be danger spots that we know nothing of you see with a crowd there is comparative safety but should one of you straggle away and get into trouble it might be difficult to help admonished uncle bill the very seriousness of the habitually jolly man made an impression on the boys so that fred promised for all of them and we'll be all right folks never fear added he i don't see why we girls can't go with you panted trixie that isn't it but i really do not approve of the boys going alone to say nothing of you girls going too remonstrated aunt miriam the boys made quick work of getting away for fear of being called back by one of the troubled mothers while the girls were soon engaged in finding new specimens of flowers for their books if we gather them now we can identify and arrange them after lunch this noon suggested elizabeth the boys had covered many acres of the island and were feeling like genuine explorers when billy suddenly spied a fish-hawk's nest high up in the tall spruce great scott bill what a chance to get a snapshot of that osprey's nest called fred it's lucky that i brought my kodak isn't it added paul the tree looks kind of risky to climb ventured dudley oh no i can climb it easy enough boasted billy bill's climbed higher and worse trees than this one added fred well seeing he's the best climber in the bunch i'll let him use my kodak if he wants to shinny up and try for a close-up picture offered paul that'll be great and i can add another one to my list of wild bird photographs 
said billy delightedly for me too said paul why no it won't count for you unless you climb up and get it remonstrated dudley an argument followed that made paul sulky but billy paid little attention to him as he took the kodak and climbed up the giant spruce there was a thick tangle of undergrowth all about the tree and the boys had had to break through this before reaching the spruce so intent were fred and dudley in watching billy go higher and ever higher that they failed to note paul's absence paul with his impatient and stubborn nature felt so piqued at the idea of not being able to claim the coup after offering the use of his kodak started away from the boys in a huff the boys never dreamed of his anger or envy over the coup winning so did not trouble to look over beyond the jungle of brush while paul be it said to his credit forgot all about uncle bill's admonition and the promise made not to wander away from the others he finally reached a small promontory of land that jutted out into the sea as he walked out on the upthrust a white strip of sandy beach was found to be lying snugly at the bottom of the bluff about a hundred feet across from the place where the boy stood another large finger of high land ran out from the shore actually making a secluded little cove of the beach my what a dandy little place for a swim i can undress down between these two high rocks and have a dip then get back into my clothes again before billy gets through with that nest said paul to himself as he slid down the steep bank to the beach once on the smooth sand the boy looked about he was well screened all right and not a thing could see beyond the high banks behind him just like a bathhouse two rock walls with some trees right behind and a peachy beach in front no one would ever dream of finding sand on this island of rocks and fir-grown boulders remarked paul to himself as he started to walk to the water's edge i'll just see how far out this little sand strip runs it may stop short just beyond and then drop down suddenly as paul bent over the sparkling water the better to scan the distance the sand ran out under the waves he felt himself slowly sinking down to his ankles in the sand ha this is funny never felt anything like it before murmured he chuckling at the queer sensation of being sucked down by the time his legs were into the shins he started to wander seriously not yet dreaming of danger however not entirely liking the grip the sand seemed to have taken on his feet paul tried to back away but found he could not tear his feet out of its clutch let go let me get out i say growled paul to the quicksand as he twisted and struggled to climb out of the mire the boy had not enough experience to know what to do in this emergency in being too far away from the other boys to be seen by them he felt that he must manage to get free of the quagmire that was drawing him in deeper every moment by the time he had sunk to the calves he was thoroughly frightened and endeavoured wildly to throw himself out of the engulfing sand the more he struggled and squirmed the quicker he sank and then desperate with his danger and horror he screamed at the top of his lungs he gazed frantically about but the only sign of habitation was a deserted-looking camp some distance away on the bluff again paul yelled help 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 and ended in a terrific cry that curdled the blood in billy's veins just as he was about to push the button in the kodak what's that yell bill called fred from below frightened billy looked around carefully and located a human speck down near the water from the manner in which it was tossing about its arms it seemed to be in dire need of help none of the boys were aware of paul's desertion but expected to find him fooling with bugs or flowers on the other side of the brush so billy thought some one unknown to them needed help someone's having a nasty time over there near the water i don't know who or what is wrong but i make out that whoever it is wants help hustle over and see fred called billy where which way in direction shouted fred looking up at billy off in that direction straight through that opening of the firs came down from billy who had started to descend the moment he took the bearings we'll run ahead you follow bill called fred turning to tell dudley and paul to come with him where's paul 
cried he, suddenly missing the boy. Why, I don't know. I was so busy watching Billy, I didn't see him leave us, replied Dudley, frightened and running after Fred as fast as he could go. Billy reached the ground and started to tear after the other boys when he heard the familiar whistle generally given as a signal from Uncle Bill when he was in search of anyone. Billy signalled in return, and soon Uncle Bill came from the fir woods and crossed the small clearing that lay between the firs and the spruce where the hawk's nest was located. Harry, come with me and help, cried Billy, catching hold of his uncle's hand before anything could be said. On the way, he breathlessly explained what he had seen from the treetop and where Fred and Dudley had gone. Must be a quicksand. If all you boys are okay, who can it be? I thought no one was on the island besides ourselves, cried Uncle Bill. I saw a sort of a hut near there when I was up in the tree, added Billy. Perhaps it is someone from the hut, but then they ought to know of the danger, I should think. Anyway, we ought to have a rope to throw, said Uncle Bill, now thoroughly anxious dragging his nephew along to keep up with his running strides i'll run over to the camp and see if i can find a line or rope said billy as they reached the edge of the grove near the bluff yes and if any one lives there get them to come and help with a board or plank billy ran along the edge of the bluff toward the camp he could see some distance away while uncle bill came out to the sheltered strip of beach where he saw fred and dudley striving to save paul's life it needed but a glance to make the whole situation clear and in wild leaps the man reached the frantic group on the sand keep still don't move shouted fred to the struggling paul the more you squirm and fight the deeper you go added dudley as uncle bill ran up behind them fred was lying on his stomach trying to shove an old fence rail out to the boy as he carefully guided it so that the end of the rail would slide over the sand and possibly would be worked under the arm of the victim he encouraged paul with advice when this rail comes near you try to get your arm over it so it can be used as a brace for you then i'll try to work another out for your other arm here fred let me do that job while dud and you run and get some more rails wherever you found these cried the welcome voice of uncle bill both boys showed signs of great relief and confidence as they gave place to the man and started for the rails of an old fence they had found while crossing the clearing near the bluff meantime billy reached the camp but found no one there it appeared to be a deserted fisherman's hut but some old rope still hung coiled upon a hook driven in the side of the doorpost when he reached the spot where uncle bill was working to help paul billy was shocked to recognize the victim fred and uncle bill managed to worm the rails out so that paul slid his arms up over them and this acted as a resistible brace against the suction of the mire then with practised hand the coil of rope was slung and as it fell it formed a loop over paul's head now work that noose down over your shoulders and when both arms are over it give the word so i can pull you out ordered uncle bill once more on terra firma paul was congratulated at his narrow escape but the pallor of his face was sufficient punishment then so that uncle bill refrained from scolding him the next thing for us to do is to scrape paul we ought to get him over to mo's where he can undress and wrap himself in a shawl till this mire is washed from his clothes said uncle bill you must keep this a secret from the girls you know warned fred if they smell a rat we'll say paul slipped into a pool of mire which is the truth laughed dudley i think some one ought to set up a danger sign at the awful spot said paul still shivering at the thought of it yes paul's right we'll go back afterwards and fix up some sort of warning for others approved fred i'll tell you how when we go back for the picture of the fishhawk's nest this afternoon we can sneak down and stick up that turkey red cushion top from the launch that will mean danger you know suggested billy and maybe you can find a can of paint or some other stuff at that shack so i can mark a warning on the boulder of a rock alongside of the sand added uncle bill paul and his rescuers reached moses camp and were fortunate enough to find everybody gone on a flower quest mose alone kept solitary vigil at the clam chowder cooking over a good campfire in a moment 
he was eager to help poor paul in his mire need here chile take these two sweaters and use em for a golfing costume climb in ta the sleeves o one sweater with your feet and pull the order down over your head strap both together and your middle wid a rope like dat now and mose assisted paul in dressing as he advised when the boy emerged from back of the bushes where he and his valet had retired the other boys laughed at the sight the sweaters made of paul mose gathered up the mari clothes and started in to scrape them as clean as possible before washing them say bo you don't ever expect to wear deeses again do you questioned he can't they be washed clean wondered paul anxiously i kin wash em but dis clamoured ain't never goin to let go for good one thing sure though it'll make the coat thicker and warmer for next winter grinned mose oh go long mose we all know you're fooling laughed billy leading paul away from the teasing cook End of chapter six Chapter seven of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island This is a Liberox recording. All Liberox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Liberox.org. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Forwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy. Chapter seven Further Adventures at Spruce Island Before Mose had quite finished washing out the muddy clothes, the flower hunters returned. Elizabeth was highly elated because she had found enough new varieties to complete her list of fifty for the wild flower coup, while Miriam's and Edith's lists had reached thirty different kinds. As the girls ran over to the group of boys to tell them about the successful hunt, Trixie stood still and gasped. The others turned to look in the direction that she was staring, and a burst of merriment sounded from them all. Good gracious, Paul, where did you find the upsy downsy suit of clothes? Are you masquerading? cried Elizabeth. Paul mumbled, but looked annoyed and uncomfortable. Doesn't he look like one of those double-headed dolls? You hold them one way and they're mammies, and you turn them up the other way and they're something else, said Trixie. Whatever put it into your head to dress that way, Paul, persisted Elizabeth. Well, you see, he thought you girls would like the clams on the half shell, so he found a spot where he tried digging, but he dug so deep while trying to catch a big, fat, juicy clam that he fell into the hole and pulled the hole in after him. We had all we could do to pull him out again, but when he finally did come out, Lou, he pulled the hole out too, explained the irrepressible Uncle Bill. So that's why Moses is giving his clothes a Turkish bath, giggled Billy. Mrs. Remington and Mrs. Farwell looked hard at Uncle Bill, but forbore saying more at that time. Moe soon completed the task given him, and then sounded a tin pan for the call to luncheon. A grand scramble ensued, and there was much confusion and advice before everyone was comfortably settled on cushions and rugs about a large cloth spread out upon the grass. The three hostesses had been very busy unpacking and arranging the contents of hampers and boxes, but now that the result of their efforts and work was finished, the hungry picnickers enjoyed the wonderful meal thoroughly, and the viands disappeared like magic. Wild and well-worn was the trail made by Mose as he tracked back and forth from famished eaters to the chowder kettle, and when Billy called for a fourth bowl of the delicious soup, the distracted chef turned the pot upside down in silence to prove that not a drop remained therein. Directly after luncheon, Uncle Bill proposed a hike around the island, stopping at the tall spruce tree to retake the snapshot of the hawk's nest, and also to place a signal on the beach of quicksand. Ah, now I know how Paul delved for that clam, murmured Mrs. Remington, nodding her head wisely. Oh, by the way, maybe Billy was requisitioned too much chowder to be in time to climb that tree, said Uncle Bill quietly, the moment he recognized the blunder he had made. Oh, no, you don't, Bill, laughed Mrs. Farwell. You fairly caught this time, and we demand knowledge of that clam-digging fee. However, Uncle Bill was not to be caught napping again, so he began a long, tiresome story of clam-digging, until everyone told him to cut it short. 
having succeeded in taking a picture of the fish hawk's nest and rigging up the red banner for a signal to unwary hikers, as well as painting a warning on the front face of the rock in white lead. The entire crowd continued the hike over the island. After many adventures, they came to a small beach at the north end of the island, where the winter storms washed ashore all sorts of debris. Paul spied a gleaming white section of a skeleton, and he ran excitedly over, calling as he went, Come on, boys, see what I've found. The others followed, and soon were examining a number of vertebrae of a whale. By the great horn spoon is a remnant of that old whale here yet, cried Uncle Bill in surprise. What old will do tell us the story? begged Billy, scenting an exciting adventure of Uncle Bill's youth. Well, when I was about your age, my brother and I took a sail one day and landed for lunch at this island. We intended to spend the day fishing for cod and then start home about sunset. Just about the time we were ready for lunch, the wind veered and brought the most dreadful odour to our nostrils. We looked at each other while reaching the same conclusion. Something unusual had been washed ashore. Say, Bill, folks say, follow your nose, shall we? Asked my brother. Sure thing, come on, I said. And we ran down to this beach, and right here we came upon a young whale which yet was ancient of days. Even in death, the strength of the whale was more than our lusty powers of resistance, so we both returned to the lunch minus an appetite. The fire was smothered, and we sadly resumed our caught fishing, but strange to say, it had lost its zest for us, and the boat seemed very wobbly. We returned home quite early that day and took relief in a mad game of tennis. That evening, we felt better and could partake of slight nourishment. Everyone laughed at Uncle Bill's experience, and Dudley made a suggestion. Let's take home the vertebra for souvenirs. It won't have the same effect now as it had years ago, that's certain, said Uncle Bill. So each boy loaded himself with the whitened bones of the whale, while the elders slowly retraced their steps. At the clearing where the picnic was held, Mouse was found taking advantage of the peace by enjoying a well-earned snooze. The chef was roused by the noise made by the returning explorers, and Billy eagerly showed him the souvenirs. Whale bones, Mouse, the same one Uncle Bill found when he was a boy. What? Whale bones? You don't mind to tell me that damn things is what they put in ladies' coat. You know, that, that, well, you all know what that means. Them articles what the ladies wear to make them look slim. Delicately hinted Mose. Everyone ha ha at the manner of Mose's questioning, and Uncle Bill explained that the whale bone of commerce and corsets came from the rows of screen plates that are so arranged in the whale's mouth that all of his food is drained out from his sea water soup. Just luck as how it would be if you took a mouth of chowder and shut your teeth to keep in the clams where you squirt out all the water, eh? asked Mose eagerly. Just so, only more so, laughed Uncle Bill. After a light supper on the picnic grounds, haste was made to embark. The tide was ebbing, and there was no wind, so the dory was filled with the boxes and baskets and towed behind the lounge. As the mariners came out from the shadow of the overhanging bluffs of Spruce Island, the moon, still in its last quarter, shone silvery white in the heavens, and the stars sparkled with unusual brightness. The woodcrafters gazed at the blue dome overhead, and started talking about the constellations. Who can show me where to find the pole star? then asked Uncle Bill. Instantly, many voices replied to this question. Paul, now's your chance to point out the four constellations you boasted about when the last tassel was cut from your badge, teased Uncle Bill. I will, returned Paul. The pole star is in the little bear, and there's the dipper, or the big bear. Way over in the west is Arcturus, I know him by the big star, see? Then that one up there in the northeast is Cassiopeia. It looks just like a W. That makes four. Good for you. Now who else can name any? said Uncle Bill. I can, cried Elizabeth. Directly over our heads you will find Vega in Lyra. And, oh, Paul, you forgot to mention Orion in yours. Ha ha, that's one on you, Elizabeth, because you can't see Ryan until early morning up here, laughed Fred. Why? There are the Pleiades and Ryan is near them, argued Elizabeth. 
but those aren't the pliers, although I'll admit it looks like them, protested her brother. Nuts drops coffin. Well, I never. I've always said they were the pliers, even though I thought they appear a little bit strange to me, said the surprised girl. What are those stars near the drops coffin? asked Billy. Nuts Aquila, answered Mrs. Remington. Now, let me get this down straight, came from Billy. First, that W is Cassiopeia. Next to her, what are those four big stars like a square? It is called the Great Square of Pegasus, replied Mrs. Remington. Then comes Aquila and Job's coffin, and above us you find Lyra. Look, what is that large star in the northeast? It is low down on the horizon, but it is rising fast, cried Dudley. Everyone turned to gaze at the beautiful twinkling star that seemed to sway in the sky. In fact, Billy denied it was a star. Anyone can see with half an eye that that's a fire balloon, argued he. However, it proved itself to be a star, and finally Mrs. Remington and Fred identified it as Capella, and the atmospheric conditions near the horizon accounted for its gyrations. But, Mother, it is moving east, cried Elizabeth. It is a fire balloon, because no star travels that way, added Billy. Here Uncle Bill offered an explanation of the marvel. It's a star, right, Billy, and it really is moving east to us, because we're so far north that we see it below, but it's ordinarily the horizon. Watch carefully now, and soon you will see it move west, and behave as all other well-trained stars do. This proved to be so, and before the party quite reached home, Capella had risen high in the heavens to join the orderly procession of the westward moving stars. Do any of you know the Elfin Queen name for the Big Dipper? asked Mrs. Remington. Aunt Miriam demonstrated her knowledge of the zodiac at this point, and told the story of Ojeek Anun, the Fisher Star. Ojeek Anon was a mighty hunter. He lived with his wife and little son on the shores of the Great Lake. They always had plenty to eat because Ojeek was so skillful in the chase. But at that time it was always winter in the land. The sky people kept the birds of summer shut up in cages in the fields of heaven. The little son complained of the continual cold, especially when his hands were stiff and aching so that he could not use his bow and arrow on squirrels and rabbits. One day, when he cried with the cold, a squirrel hopped up and told him, Keep on crying and complaining no matter what your parents offer you for consolation, and at last your father, who is a magician, will promise you anything you want if you will only stop crying. Then ask him to make summer in the land. The boy followed the squirrel's advice and it happened as he said it would. Oji called all his fellow chiefs together and they made strong medicine and started off to climb to heaven. Finally, they reached the top of a high mountain, and from there they could jump into heaven by breaking through the celestial floor. Before the sky people could stop them, Ojeek had cut open the cages and freed the birds of summer. They flew quickly down through the hole in heaven, and so we now have summer and warmth and flowers. Poor Ojeek was overtaken by the skyman, and although he changed himself into his totem animal, the fisher, he died from an arrowhead in the tip of his tail, the only spot that was vulnerable. As he died, he exclaimed, I am satisfied to die because I have done such good, not only to my son, but to all who come hereafter. There he is in the sky as a remembrance, what we call the dipper's handle. The Indians call Ojig's long tail with the arrow sticking in the end. What is the fisher like? questioned Paul. It's like an otter or a sable or a marten, replied Billy, the hunter. This marten story makes six different names of her the dipper go by, and I suppose there really are others, remarked Elizabeth. Six, explained Paul in surprise. What are they besides the bear and the dipper and this fisher old jig? Why? There are the seven plough oxen, the seven rishes, or wise men, and the Persian heft or ring or seven thrones explained Elizabeth, lover of poetry and romance. But the stars were soon forgotten after the woodcrafters landed and wearily sought their cots. A full and happy day in the open made most of them sleepy and glad to stretch out for the night. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Falwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy. Chapter 8 The Cruise to Castine. Mother, if we're to have that masked ball that all of you were talking about, it ought to be given this week, so's to have Uncle Bill with us. You see, he starts back to the city next week, said Fred, one morning soon after the picnic. Aunt Miriam and I were discussing that very thing last night, and we have decided to hold it in Fudge Attic, at Isola Bella, some night this week. Haven't you determined upon any special night? asked Fred. As far as we can tell now, it will be Friday. Elizabeth had entered the room as they were speaking, and stood holding a note that Captain had brought her from Isola Bella. At her mother's words, she smiled delightedly. Oh, that is just fine, cause Miriam has invited Trixie and me to visit her for a few days this week. She handed her mother the note, and waited until the verdict was given. Of course, Elizabeth knew she would be permitted to go, but she had no thought of accepting, or planning for the visit, without her mother's knowledge and consent. Be sure and take everything you may need for the ball. If your suitcase isn't large enough to hold what you will need, let Anna find you a suit-box for the costume, advised her mother. I'll sail you over if you like, Elizabeth, offered Fred. I've only done half of my hundred and fifty miles for the sailing coup, and I want to get in as much as I can every day. Billy sauntered in at this junction, wondering where his big brother could be. What's up? Eliza going away? he queried, hearing Fred's offer and his sister's smiling acceptance. Mrs. Remington told him about the invitation, and Billy chuckled. "'That's good. Then you won't be here to see how we are going to be togged out for the ball, and Trix and Miriam won't have anyone to tell them who we are.' Turning to his brother, after having delivered this speech, Billy added, "'Say, can't you let me take the sail with you?' "'Sure, if you want to come.' "'Boys!' Why don't both of you take a cruise and cover a lot of ground at one time? I mean, a lot of water in one day, suggested Mrs. Remington. Oh, mother, can we? cried Billy. I'd like to, if you think it's all right, mother, added Fred. If the weather is good and you make careful plans, I see nothing to hinder your trying it, smiled Mrs. Remington. Billy for you, mother dear. Fred, when can we start? shouted Billy, tossing his cap up to the ceiling. We can start tomorrow. Captain Ed says we are in for a good spell of fine weather now, replied Fred. So, as soon as the two boys returned from escorting their sister to Isola Bella, they began preparing for the cruise. The kindly captain helped with the outfitting of the little dory, and remarked that if they got an early start in the morning, they could have the flood tide to help them up the bay and then have all of the ebb to come back on. "'I'll keep a lookout about sunset, and if the wind flushes out, I'll come after you with the launch,' concluded he. Mose willingly agreed to cook an early breakfast for the two boys, and he also tipped a wink to Billy to come to the pantry and take a look in the cake box. Billy needed no second invitation, and when he beheld the delicious-looking cake reposing there for appreciative cannibals, he sighed and asked, Oh, Mose, that for us. If you don't say nothing about it, I'm going to see that he is tenderly wrapped up and shut away in a box for you all. But don't go and get poor Mose in bad at supper tonight when they ain't no dessert, only preserves. And that evening, a number of those seated about the supper table noted how obediently Billy ate his dish of prunes. Paul grumbled and said he hated prunes and Dudley pushed back his plateful with a wry face. Both boys then looked for some other dessert, but looked in vain. "'Prunes are awful good for one, aren't they, mother? We ought to eat plenty of prunes to be healthy,' said Billy virtuously. Paul and Dudley stared at their chum in amazement. Hm, "'Some folks get good all of a sudden,' sniffed Paul. Mrs. Remington had to control her face behind her napkin, 
and to change the subject she said, "'Where have you decided to go on your cruise tomorrow? "'Up to Castine and back again,' replied Billy. "'We expect to start about seven in the morning,' added Fred. "'Oh, can't we go with you?' cried Dudley coaxingly. "'No, indeed,' answered Mrs. Remington decidedly. "'You know nothing about sailing, and the dory is too small for a day's sail for more than two people.' The two youngsters were inclined to dispute this decision, but Fred cut short their grumbling by offering a salve in form of an invitation to spend the day on Captain Ed's farm. The captain lived on the mainland and made periodical trips across the bay to bring back butter and eggs from his farm. This idea of going with the captain pleased Paul and Dudley so that they went to bed in an amicable frame of mind. Early the next morning every one was up to see the boys off on the cruise, and breakfast was eaten in much excitement. It was a perfect day that seemed made to order for the sailors. A light southerly wind was blowing, and soon the tide would begin to flow, and that would help them along materially. Paul and Dudley, still yearning for the joys of a cruise, watched the dory leave the float stage, and then they ran to the north end of the island just to see the last of the little craft and the two boys they so heartily envied that morning. But no time was wasted in vain regrets when once the dory was out of sight. The two boys hurried back to the float to wait for Captain Ed, who was to carry them away for a glorious day on his farm. On the way over to the mainland, the captain said, "'I've got a young colt that needs a brave bronco-buster to ride him.' "'Oh, Captain, let me try and ride it, will you?' cried Paul. "'I can ride better than Paul, Captain,' urged Dudley. "'No, you can't neither. And now, Captain, please let me ride her.' "'Well, she's young and gentle, all right, but full of fire, like most young things. So I don't see any objection to both of you boys riding her, if you're careful.' "'And, Paul, we'll draw lots for the first ride.' "'The colt is a great pet.' and she may show a little fear of you two indians at first but she'll get used to you if you give her some sugar advised the captain it was a scant mile's walk from the cove to the farm but a friendly neighbour's jigger was found going their way and the three had a lift as far as the crossroads did you ever see such a funny axle it's got a broken back exclaimed paul curiously it looks to me more like a crankshaft said Dudley. "'Well, a jigger's a mighty handy thing for hauling heavy loads,' explained Captain Ed. "'But it ain't no pneumatic cushions for sore bones,' chuckled the neighbour. "'No, sir, he, nor no sea-spring buggy neither,' <gasps> laughed Captain Ed. Before the boys reached the farm, their breakfast was well jounced down, so that the homemade cake and milk offered them by the farmer's wife was most welcome. "'We came to ride your, your colt,' declared Paul between bites. "'Oh, no, we came to visit you, Mrs. Blake, "'but the captain told us we might ride the colt,' "'hurriedly corrected Dudley with greater diplomacy. "'Paul stared, and Mrs. Blake laughed understandingly, "'but she immediately invited the boys to come with her to the pasture. "'She carried a bridle over her arm, and when they reached the lot, Brownie was coaxed to come over and nibble a lump of sugar from her mistress's hand. While doing this, the colt kept her eyes on the two strange boys. But it is safe to say that Brownie would not have submitted to the bridle had it not been for the extra sugar the boys gave her. While Mrs. Blake held the colt by the forelock and bridle, Paul, who had won the prized slip of paper, tried to mount. The boy had taken short rides at home on Billy Remington's pony, but this was an entirely new proposition. After a number of trials and failures to mount, Dudley laughed and cried to him, "'Hey there! Come over and mount from this stone wall!' So Mrs. Blake led Brownie over to the wall while Paul scrambled on top, and in that way managed to slide over on the colt's silky bare back. The moment Brownie felt a strange burden on her back, she grew unmanageable and tried in every way to dislodge it. "'Grip her sides with your knees, boy!' called Mrs. Blake. The moment Brownie felt the restraining hand removed from her bridle, she started off on a lope for the pasture gate. The boys had left it open as they entered, 
and through it the colt shot and made down the lane, Paul clinging to her with might and main, knowing it was now a case of stick or flick. Just as both of them began to feel better acquainted, and hopes for enjoyment rose in Paul's breast, the horn of a passing motor tooted on the main road at the end of the lane. The awful blast startled Brownie, so that she wheeled and tore back to her home in the pasture. Oh, what a race that was, over hummocks and swales of fern! Then suddenly the colt stopped short by bracing her forefeet and humping her back, and as suddenly Paul became an aviator. Luckily he landed in comparatively soft sod, so that the only injury he sustained was a loss of wind. "'I never knew Brownie to act like that before,' commented the captain's wife, as Dudley and she stood watching. "'Oh, Paul isn't experienced like me. I can manage her all right. You will see.' bragged Dudley, fearing lest Mrs. Blake might decide to give Brownie her freedom. However, the colt had to be caught before Dudley could ride, and both boys, as well as Mrs. Blake, grew hot and tired in their endeavours. Finally, Brownie was beguiled by some young, tender carrots, and Dudley climbed upon her back while Mrs. Blake fed the colt the delicacy. "'Run and shut that pasture gate, Paul!' shouted Dudley. Paul did as he was bid, and then sat upon the top rail to watch the boastful rider. At first it seemed as if Brownie, too, was tired and willing to be guided in the way she should go, so Dudley began to have confidence and bravado. "'Look, Paul, this is the way to make them wheel,' called he, digging his heel into the colt's flank. "'Wheel Brownie did all right. She was off in a jiffy, circling round the pasture, jumping the familiar hummocks in her way, and finally sailing over the low stone wall, then racing lickety-split down the lane. Dudley had no objections to thumping over the soft sod of the lane, as it really was preferable to the boulders in the pasture, but the colt became vexed with the boy's close clinging, and with a tossing of her mane resorted to an equine trick, that of trying to brush off an unwelcome rider. Try as he would, Dudley could not prevent Brownie from passing under the low-hanging branches near the end of the lane. Believing discretion to be the better part of valour, the boy slipped off before he was sawed off by the neck. The moment the colt realised her pest was gone, she kicked up her heels and snorted with derision. Paul hugged himself in wild delight when he saw Dudley carefully limping back to the pasture, but their troubles were soon forgotten by hearing the captain call for aids in catching some chickens that were needed on Sunset Island. The milder delights of rural life, chickens, pigs, cows, yea, even sheep, came in for fervid attention after that. Then, early in the afternoon, well laden with baskets full of fresh vegetables as well as the broilers, eggs and butter, the three mariners sailed the seas again to Sunset Isle. About five o'clock there came signs of a gathering storm, and the sky grew black in the north. The wind had changed and blew from the northeast in increasing violence. The captain became anxious, but saying nothing to Mrs. Remington, trained the spyglass in the direction from which the two boys and the dory should first be seen. A few moments' scrutiny showed a tiny speck gleaming white against the darkening waters. Soon, with the naked eye, he was able to discern the little craft about two miles north of the island. Then he went in search of Mrs. Remington. "'Well, the two boys are piling home double-quick. They'll be here in a few minutes,' said he with relief. The mother was secretly relieved also, as she had felt concerned over the delay of the boys and the approaching storm. "'Let's run up and see em come around the north end,' shouted Dudley excitedly. "'Let's all go!' said Paul, looking at Mrs. Remington invitingly. Without parley, they started for the nearest point which the boys would make before running into the lee of the island. By the time the eager islanders reached the north end, the dory was almost there. "'She's carrying too much sail. They ought to have reefed her,' exclaimed the captain, trying to make himself heard above the roaring of the wind. "'Well, they're here now,' sighed Mrs. Remington while every one on shore strained eyes to watch the dory manoeuvre as she approached the narrow passage between the ledges of rock leading to safety in the lee, an extra squall rendered the over-rigged boat unmanageable. Over she went. 
Quick as a flash, the two sailors were out on the centreboard keel. She righted, but was full of water. Billy ran down the sail, while Fred chucked ballast overboard. In the meantime, the watchers on shore gasped, and every face went white. But Captain Ed, finding the boys would be comparatively safe, because of the airtight compartments making the dory unsinkable, ran swiftly to the float stage and got his launch. But quick as he was, the two sailors were more than half a mile away, blown by the fury of the wind. He just managed to catch up with them before they were wrecked on the Isleboro shore. During this flight before the storm, the boys had not been idle. One bailed madly, while the other tried to keep her head on to the storm. It was a long, hard tow for the little launch in the teeth of the gale, with the half-filled dory dragging drunkenly behind. When at last the boats came in the lee of the island, the nerves of those afloat, as well as those on shore, suddenly relaxed, and made everyone feel and act foolish from relief. Fred and Bill were rushed up to the bungalow for a change into dry clothes, while Dudley and Paul heaped wood upon the roaring fireplace in the living room. Most got busy with an unusually good hot supper, and soon after everyone was hailed to sit down for the belated meal. As Mose brought in a great platter of broiled chicken with hot waffles, he remarked hypocritically, "'I don't know whether there's any flag up for dessert tonight, "'cause I ain't done gone and made none.' "'Oh, Mose, what do you call waffles?' laughed Fred. "'Oh, there's just chicken fixins,' grinned the southerner. "'Well, just give me a pile of those same fixins and a jug of maple syrup, and you can wave the flag sky-high as far as I'm concerned, remarked Billy, the connoisseur. How, 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 echoed from the circle around the table. That night, when dinner had been cleared away, the family grouped itself in front of the driftwood fire, and prepared to hear the tale of the cruise. The storm was howling and raging without, but the great tongues of purple and green flame that shot up the chimney from the driftwood suffused a cheery feeling to the islanders. We had a cinch getting up to Castine, with a flood tide and that nice southerly, began Fred. It didn't flush out until we got inside the harbour. You know that little Nautilus Island, mother? asked Billy. Well, we ran in back of that and over to a fine little cove. We took out the fishing lines, and in fifteen minutes we had a mess of tom cod. Say, maybe tom cod and bacon isn't the food for the gods, eh, what, Bill? remarked Fred, smacking his lips at the memory of his savoury feast. "'You bet! We landed after catching enough fish and made a good fire to broil them. Then we ate lunch. We wound up on that cake Mose sneaked into our hamper last night.' Paul and Dudley exchanged looks that said as plainly as words, "'Now we know why Billy preferred prunes.' "'You know, mother, we always wanted to explore the Bagajus River.' Well, this was a swell chance, with the tide still running up. So we up-anchored and started off. We'd have been home long before the storm came, if we hadn't gone so far up the river. But it was worth the trouble, wasn't it, Bill? Yeah, there's the place where old Baron Castine and the Terratine Indians camped when Maine was first settled, added Billy. Then, when the wind changed this afternoon, we were up that river eating the last crumbs of cake. It began to look a little squally so we considered we'd better make tracks for home, and we sure did make a track, all froth and foam. It didn't get to be a real storm, you know, until about five o'clock, so that's why we hadn't reefed the sail, explained Fred. We went along fine for a time. I never knew the dory to go so fast, but finally we realised that we needed that reef, Billy continued. We would have run down the sail and put in the reef out in the open bay, but Fred said, Oh, half a minute more will see us in the lee of the island. We would have been all right if that nasty little squall hadn't caught us just half a minute too soon. Boys, you knew you ought to have a reef in the sail, and hereafter don't wait that half minute too late to put it in. The cause of accidents and loss of life is that same excuse. Oh, we'll be all right in half a minute warned Mrs. Remington. "'How does it feel to climb out on the centreboard in a gale?' asked Dudley, curiously. "'Didn't stop to diagnose the feeling,' laughed Fred. "'I just guess not,' added Billy. 
"'I bet you were glad there were air tanks in your dory all right,' declared Paul. "'I just bet we were, too,' sighed both adventurers. And Fred added, "'We knew we'd be all right if we just got out the ballast, even though she was full of water.' But all the same, we were glad to see the captain heave in sight through the spray, and then when we got near the island, it kind of felt good to see you all waiting to welcome us, smiled Billy. I never saw anything drift so fast in all my life, even though the wind and tide were working together, said Dudley. Advice is most uninteresting to youth, and when Mrs. Remington began to advise the reckless sailors, Fred quickly changed the subject. "'Well, Dad, what did you and Paul do at the farm today?' Both boys plunged into the story of the bronco-busting, each one giving high-coloured account of the other's inexperience in riding a colt. Then, as they arrived at the relation of the quieter sports of feeding the livestock and catching chickens, they looked at each other and finally doubled up in laughter. "'What's the joke? Tell us, too,' wondered Billy. "'How did you like the broilers tonight?' asked Paul. "'Why, they tasted good as usual. Why?' wondered Fred. "'Because we've heard that the flavour of a chicken has to do with the way it is killed. How do you like your chickens killed? Heads chopped off or necks wrung?' asked Paul. "'All the same to me as long as I get it,' replied Billy. "'Well, how do you suppose they'd taste if they were suffocated to death?' persisted Dudley, and both Paul and he laughed again. "'You didn't do that, did you?' cried Edith, horrified. "'Well, two of the tender chickens we had tonight were suffocated by Dud and me, but not intentionally,' admitted Paul. "'You see, it was this way. We had been catching chickens for the captain, and these two got away and hid under the haystack outside the barn. The captain started chopping off heads, and I got one chicken as it flounced around without its head, and chased Paul with it, just when Paul doubled in his tracks.' I was swinging the chicken about, holding it by one leg. He ran plump into it, and then said I lambed him with it. Ha, 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 chuckled Dudley. Well, you did too, Dud. You were just going to swing it at my head anyway, when I turned to dodge you. But I got even, interrupted Paul. Paul ran me in the barn, and chased me up into the hayloft. But I jumped out on this big haystack to get away from him. He followed right after me, and both of us slid down the side and landed on top of each other. One wild squawk from the chickens underneath us told how we had landed on top of them. They died so quick they hadn't time to make a will to dispose of their heads, laughed Dudley at the remembrance. We carried the two chickens back and told the captain of their unexpected end, and he said, That's a new form of capital punishment. While the children talked over the rural sports of the captain's farm, Mrs. Remington seemed absent-minded. When they had worn the subject threadbare, however, she made a remark. "'I've been thinking about the masked ball. You should have been planning long before this as to the costumes you intend wearing.' "'How do you know that we haven't been planning?' asked Fred, smilingly. "'Oh, I'm glad if you have, but I haven't heard about it,' said she. "'Haven't you heard a wild tin can sound coming from the direction of the pump-house lately?' queried Fred. "'Why, oh, yes, I believe I have. What is it?' quizzed his mother. "'That's the secret of my costume. Nobody will ever guess what it is to be. So I won't tell beforehand,' returned Fred. "'I'm going as Red Riding Hood,' exclaimed Edith. "'Dad was going to be a pirate, but Billy told him of some other good idea.' "'So I'm going to use the pirate's things,' said Paul. "'Yes, Bill and I are going to be a pair, "'but we need you to help us make the things, Mrs. Remington,' added Dudley. "'What is it?' "'Why, Mother, Dud and I want to be bears, "'a white polar bear for me and a cinnamon bear for Dud, "'and we need some old blankets for the suits,' explained Billy. "'I wouldn't want to spoil any good blankets by cutting them up for suits.' "'But Anna has some white cotton flannel for the polar bear, "'and I think I know where there is some brown material that will do for the other, "'and you can sew the bear rug on the back of it,' suggested Mrs. Remington. "'And maybe you and Anna can cut out and stitch up the suits. "'That will be all, you know. Dad and I will do all the rest,' wheedled Billy. "'There isn't anything else to do after that, is there?' laughed Anna. 
to make two bearskins seems a large order billy said mrs remington then thoughtfully added maybe we can use the pattern of the sleeping suits that have feet and mittens attached and we have the sewing machine that will run up the seams quickly of course it will be dead easy said dudley and be sure you leave enough room when you cut out the stuff to give us a chance to stuff pillows in front we're going to be big fat bears you see added billy with concern everyone laughed but fred had an idea which he mentioned bill you ought to rig up some strings that connect with the inside so that you can wiggle the ears and stumpy tail that's what i will won't it be fun laughed billy after that conversation the time was given to the making of costumes for the mask fred still jealously guarding his secret work going on in the pump-house while every one expressed the wildest conjectures as to what he could be making the first time the two bears tried on their costumes mose was heard singing his favourite revival hymn swing low sweet chariot going forward carry me home while he worked in the adjoining room mischief uppermost in his thought billy whispered to dudley say let's hide in mose's tent to-night and when he goes to bed we'll growl like bears and jump out on him great but don't let anyone know or they'll stop us replied dudley the tooting of the orion's whistle just then interrupted any further planning and every one rushed out to meet the visitors mr and mrs charlton had a plan to propose to mrs remington so the eldest went into a secret conference from which the children were excluded but now and then a word sounded from unwary speakers words like boston manage if they will all cooperate and see uncle bill about it made the boys curious when the conclave ended the children besieged miss travis to tell them what every one was going to wear to the ball indeed we won't tell said she emphatically not much added uncle tom humph do you mean you're going to wear bathing suits or cannibal costumes laughed billy oh a little more material than those take i hope laughed aunt edith while appreciating her nephew's quick wit wish we had thought of bathing suits we could have saved much expense and time said uncle tom regretfully i think you ought to tell us what you're going in persisted billy ask me no questions and i'll tell you no lies retorted uncle tom and there the matter rested that night the wild uproar in moses tent testified to the time the two bears attacked him the rest of the family rushed affrightedly over to rescue the valuable cook but found him upon the floor of his tent writhing in convulsions of fear with two savage bears thumping on top of him a veil must be drawn over that harrowing scene but mrs remington wondered whether her chef was quaking in a fit of terror or only shaking in laughter especially as he had seen anna sewing on the two costumes for the bears End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Folwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy chapter nine the night of the masked ball the night so anxiously anticipated came at last as there was no moon everything lay in velvety blackness this was considered opportune as it helped to hide the maskers when the launches landed them on the wharf of isola bella fudge attic presented a bright contrast to the darkness out of doors for it was gay with lights and coloured bunting and the paraffin waxed floor already waiting for impatient feet bridget stationed just off the landing of the stairway queened it over a huge punch bowl filled with lemonade while the laundry had been transformed into a buffet given in charge of mose the music was furnished by the two captains one with his fiddle and the other with a concertina 
as it was impossible for both to play and keep time together they alternated in the demonstration of their aunt lanciers and quadrilles were the popular dances with the captains so they turned up for a grand match to begin with the maskers in couples waited to take part although every couple was not a pair a grand pasha with a diamond sunburst in the front of his turban led a red cross nurse around the attic following came in a knight in tin armour with a gypsy maiden then came a happy hooligan and a girly girl next little red riding hood and a pumpkin clown and directly at their heels ran the two bears on all fours sniffing eagerly at the basket carried by their prospective victim the trail of the lonesome pine came stately and slowly all by herself branches taking up such a spread of room after her danced the yellow kid with a spanish maid who shook a tambourine tinkling with bells a bewitching japanese consorted with a well-filled laundry bag and the news of the day came with a breton peasant carrying a swaddled babe last but not least the parrot of penzance marched with a pierrette with an excruciating wail from the fiddle the march ended and a breathless instant ensued when every one tried to pierce the disguise of the others no one would speak for fear of being identified by next friends the two bears could growl of course and this they did to their own great satisfaction captain ed shouted in his most nautical voice take your partners for the lanciers in feigned tones cavaliers invited nurse bag and jap to step the light fantastic with them while bears clung to a pine and red riding hood until the sets were all made up at the command salute partners heads bowed low and the two bears swayed barefully from side to side then at the call swing corners both bears tried to hug the little jap girl so closely that she cried out to the pasha for help during this lively dance the lonesome pine flow flow left much of her trail upon the floor and mose found it necessary to hurriedly sweep up the branches with a broom before the lanciers ended most of the maskers were identified and therefore were known by their christian names the pasha however insisted upon the deference due his rank and resented the familiar appellation of uncle bill suddenly from the admiring circle drawn up about the grand pasha miriam's voice piped forth why papa you've got on mamma's sunburst of diamonds Shh, you impertinent jap don't you know that girly girl hasn't discovered my decoration let me bask in its rays while i may came from the pasha in wary accents at that moment the tin knight rattled up while the polar bear growled out listen to the ford car approaching as the red riding hood turned to watch the knight in armour trying to keep his tin can plates in order a revelation came to her and she cried oh now i know what all that hammering in the pump house was for but where did you find all the empty cans fred the concertina now squawked out to its full length and caused every one to choose a mate for the dance captain benton bawled all ready for a polka and started the musical trocity wheezing at the same time his body swayed and pitched like a ship in a storm keeping time with every long drawn-out extension of the bellows as his vivid imagination pictured the old-time dances he used to step so merrily with his best girl the faster sounded the wails from the concertina and more erratic grew the time until finally the dance ended in a wild riot uncle bill decided this was the time to calm excitement by refreshing the inner man particularly as the little tots had to go to bed so everyone trooped down to the well-filled laundry table where mose was kept busy handing out refreshments then once more back in the attic the fun waxed fast and furious uncle tom called for attention i am now about to distribute slips of paper for each one to write down the name of the costume considered the winner whoever receives the most votes will be presented with a prize the one considered having the funniest or oddest costume will also receive a prize 
this announcement was received with loud acclamations of satisfaction and surprise for it was not known before during the comparative quiet while all were pondering the merits of the costumes a loud boom bang came like a blast from the back bay every one rushed to the eastern windows of the attic and captain ed being there first yelled fire fire the others gazed wildly from the windows as a long sheet of flame forked up into the darkness of the night boom boom bang came again and a mighty fourth of july display glittered back of the dark firs fringing the shore by this time the pasha grabbing a large fire extinguisher tore down the stairs and went headlong down to the beach the rest of the maskers were not slow to follow so that before the third explosion sounded they all were near enough to see by the reflection of the flare that a blazing launch was stranded on isola bella and already like a torch one of the fir trees was burning fiercely the danger was evident to all for even the youngest islander knew that if once the first caught fire the entire island was doomed not only the trees and buildings but also the peat-like soil would burn off of the rocks the frantic pasha minus turban and sunburst and with only one tiger shawl trailing from his shoulders plied the chemicals incessantly while tin knight and the dusky major domo of the buffet tore down blazing fragments of neighbouring trees and the erstwhile musicians bravely exerted their muscular strength in pushing off the burning launch from the wharf and when they finally succeeded but at the cost of hair and hands uncle tom yellow kid and the two bears quickly formed a bucket brigade of all the other maskers and with their aid the last spark burning on the island was deluged and extinguished after the terrific battle and excitement of the fire had calmed down a forlorn group were discovered huddled on the rocks near the wharf the owner of the doomed launch gazed hopelessly at the burning boat while his wife cried pitifully by his side the story was soon told the man was returning from belfast with three barrels of gasoline on board the gasoline caught fire how he could not tell uncle bill concluded that a back fire from the engine ignited the fumes from a leaky tank and of course it took but a moment to wrap the entire launch in flame the man and his wife had taken to their small boat as soon as the fire burst forth knowing of the awful danger incurred from the presence of the three barrels of gasoline even though they had escaped before the explosions both of them were burned the man's hands were severely blistered it was long after midnight before the burns and blisters had been given first aid treatment then a smudged and frazzled masquerade party were free to go to bed the water-soaked yellow kid escorted a smoke-streaked pierrette and a skeleton pine nothing now but a few threads and sticks left to the green plumes to the orion and home thankful indeed were they that the fire had left them the orion in which to go home as for the sunset islanders they were so excited that no thought of sleep was entertained it was nearly dawn before the last whisper was silenced in their tents and then bill was heard to say let's go over to isola bella the first thing in the morning and have a look at the wreck and his mother called if you boys don't go to sleep there won't be any morning because you'll sleep into the late afternoon however boys never fail to wake up early if there is a circus or some other great excitement to be enjoyed so all of the island boys were up and ready to start for uncle bill's the moment breakfast was over their intent was to view the wreck and take pictures of the charred remains but once having landed on the wharf they found uncle bill with downcast expression a most unusual thing boys said he taking them into his confidence you remember the pasha's diamond sunburst of last night yes they all did well somehow the pasha in his undignified exit from the ballroom lost his turban of course the sunburst was with it the turban has been found but no sunburst gee what did aunt miriam say cried billy sympathetically well she is annoyed we'll help you look for it uncle bill instantly volunteered the boys from sunset island start right in now the sooner the quicker for me replied uncle bill 
but the most careful and minute search by the boys failed to locate anything like a brooch finally every one on isla bella was enlisted in the campaign but without success several old croquet balls some tennis balls a lost doll of betty's and other valueless miscellany were combed out from the tall ferns but no diamonds and bill yelled with joy i've got it here is the bunch of sparkles every one ran swiftly to be in at the death but it turned out to be a bit of broken cut glass that lay hidden in the dew-covered green moss the indefatigable work of the hunters had to be rewarded whether the pin was found or not so all were invited to sit down to a well-laden table for lunch they sat discussing all possible and impossible places where the diamonds might be but aunt miriam refused to be comforted and uncle bill seemed quite unnatural in his role of penitent well miriam you may have lost the diamonds but still you are more fortunate than that poor man and his wife who lost their launch last night remarked uncle bill surprised at his wife's unusual persistence in harping on her loss but i didn't lose it you are the guilty one said she if i had that blamed old sunburst in my hand to make you happy again i'd help stake that poor old duffer to a new launch i swear i would declared uncle bill recklessly quietly then aunt miriam rose from her chair and came around the table to lean over his shoulder he thought she was about to pat him consolingly on the head and say never mind dear so he raised his hand to clasp hers in token of her ready sympathy when his fingers closed over something that gave him a sharp jab ouch by heck that pesky pin he held it out and looked hard at the cause of his recent generous offer while every one laughed freely at his predicament oh thou false and treacherous woman had i back once more the salty tears i shed o'er yon ferns while seeking for this glittering bauble moved by your pretended distress we have wasted the golden moments of this glorious day for naught the islanders laughed again while aunt miriam smiled but it was not wasted time nor loss of tears for both impelled you to act the good samaritan said his wife boys how much do you suppose i'll have to donate now to ease off my conscience regarding that launch asked uncle bill opinions varied billy taking the part of his namesake thought the man deserved a little because of his evident carelessness in carrying gasoline in barrels on his launch fred suggested that every one chip in to help but fred had a larger allowance than the younger boys so paul billy and dudley made no reply to this plan then as usual the feminine contingent carried the vote in the interests of charity and uncle bill was mulcted a goodly sum but what i want to know is where did aunt miriam find that sunburst queried fred and amid appreciative smiles that fair lady told how amid the excited rush from fudge attic the night before she had found the diamond brooch sparkling on the floor she had quietly retrieved it but had no thought of playing any joke on the pasha until she saw his very preoccupied manner and his avoidance of conversation with her she was not supposed to have missed the jewel and he was postponing the evil time as long as possible after lunch several games of tennis were enjoyed and when it came time to return to sunset island elizabeth said i may as well sail back with you i suppose yes cause we're all going to belfast in the morning to replenish the commissary department answered fred who is going demanded paul eagerly everybody who wants to we are taking the medric and expect to spend the day i suppose you'll see us up there too then as we are going to belfast to shop before uncle bill goes away he expects to leave here next week you know said aunt miriam oh won't we have fun in belfast all together cried miriam billy seemed to be thinking of a plan formed the moment he heard uncle bill would be in belfast the next day so now he turned to ask a question say uncle bill you know one time father said i could have the old engine that was taken from the launch he sold two years ago do you think you could help me sell that engine in belfast and get enough for it to help mother think she can afford to add the rest of the price for a launch uncle bill's eyes twinkled well not a brand new launch exactly 
but it will help buy that old one you've had your eye on for the past month how much does the owner want for it billy asked fred sixty dollars and every one says it's the biggest bargain at that price exclaimed billy eagerly that's a good business idea of yours billy about the old engine suppose you take it with you to-morrow and we will see how much we can raise on it responded uncle bill thanks awfully uncle bill when it came to trading the old launch engine the next day uncle bill and his namesake proved themselves to be almost as good yankees at bargaining as the man who bought it and the fifteen dollars paid billy looked mighty good to him as it meant that he was so much nearer the goal of his heart's desire the chief reason for the islanders being so eager to go to belfast was soon revealed after the arrival of the boats an earnest pilgrimage started at the ironmongers the moment the trade of the engine was consummated and continuing up the hilly street ended at the ice cream soda fountain of the drug store the proprietor made his own syrups and cream and the cooling beverages he dispensed were like nectar the adults of the party appreciated this fully as much as the juveniles much to teddy's joy they all happened to be in belfast the day which was the one advertised by the druggist offering a balloon to every one who made a ten cent purchase thus it came to pass that the downward trail of the sunset islanders was marked by shreds of exploded rubber zeppelins loaded down to the gunwale so that the lee scuppers ran with blood of beets tomatoes corn onions and other fruit the medric turned her prow to the south and sunset isle a peaceful calm brooded over the members of the party the lunch at the belfast tea-room had been supplemented by many extras in the grocery store so that no one missed moses generous midday fare say billy got any more of those coconut jumbles asked dudley wistfully after a silence no i only got a dozen ask edith for some of her ginger snaps i've got a bag of peanuts virginia jumbos want some asked elizabeth children do remember your poor weary stomachs they will be crying for rest if you don't sighed mrs remington and the ever thoughtful children wishing to allay their mother's sighs and fears rather than limit their gustatory joys moved forward where the captain stood with fred steering the boat it's a lucky thing for us that this belfast trip only happens once in a while remarked anna meaningly while cracking and chewing the two quarts of hot peanuts offered by elizabeth the islanders bethought them of one of the captain's stories say captain how about those pirates that sailed to the seas any up around here in olden times hinted billy well i've heard tell of some they do say that captain kidd plied his trade in these waters too but the worst feller ever known was manum why he was so wicked there's a song about him and my father said it didn't half do the pirate justice either oh do let us hear it captain urged the children with deprecatory coughs and some clearings of the throat the captain began singing in a nasal tenor the ballad of bold manum a curious rhyme with a salty flavour bold manum went to sea one day and it was dreary too the dreariest day that ever was seen all in the foggy dew oh we spied a lofty ship to the leeward of her she lay and it's up with our main topsails lads and after her away oh we bore right down upon her and sheered up longside and with the speaking drum umpet where are you bound he cried where are you bound cried manum sure you answer true for i have lost my longitude way back a day or two oh we are the fame of new york to lisbon we are bound captain's name is r d crave a native of that town lie you lie cried manum for such a thing can't be um lower your top sails on your caps and fall down under my lee oh these bold and thirsty pirates with their swords right in their hand they leapt aboard the merchantman 
and murdered every man all these bold and thirsty pirates they ransacked everything till they found a fair damsel aft in the waist cabbing she sat playing on her ha harp right merrily did she sing home home sweet ho o oh me there's no place like home i followed my true lover which caused me to roam oh some they cursed and some they saw they'd have her for a wife when up stepped bold manum saying oh i will end all strife oh he rushed upon that fair damsel without any fear or dread catching her by her long fair hair he slithered off her head captain ed sang the pirate's song with such vivid interpretation and dramatic gesticulations that his audience felt a delightful shiver run along their spines when he finished a wild applause rewarded his effort then elizabeth was stirred to emulate the captain's donation to music so she offered to sing another old-time sailor's song called strike strike the bell this was a favourite with fred and billy so they joined in and soon every one took up the refrain oh it is the lookout man walking on his beat up and down the forecastle with cold hands and feet thinking of his father and mother as well and wishing you would hurry up and strike strike the bell strike the bell now second mate and send the watch below look away to wind when and you'll see it's going to blow look in the glass and you'll find it as well and a wishing you would hurry up and strike strike the bell aft is the steerman standing at his wheel tapping now at his toe now at his heel thinking of his true love who in her home doth dwell and wishing you would hurry up and strike strike the bell strike the bell now second mate and send the watch below look away to windward and you'll see it's going to blow look in the glass and you'll find it as well and a wishing you would hurry up and strike strike the bell the song ended the peanut bag was emptied and the crackers all gone with the metric came to glide up close to the float stage the passengers jumped off and rushed up to the bungalow calling for mose supper most ready mose we're all as hungry as wolves cried each and every one of the young islanders but anna exchanged looks with mrs remington who shook her head over the over-recurrent question are the stomachs of the young people lined with the metal that never wears out End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by Mary Falwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy. Chapter Ten. For the honor of the black bears. "'Who wants to sail over to Rosemary and bring back some burlap bags of hay?' called Fred, one rather cloudy morning when everyone felt undecided about doing anything on account of the weather. The three younger boys hastily volunteered and were told to get ready. "'Say, this is a case of sow-westers and oilskins, boys,' called Fred when he saw them coming from the bungalow with caps and sweaters. "'Why do you need hay? We haven't a horse or cow to feed,' questioned Dudley." never mind replied billy who knows what sort of a wild animal may be prowling around the island pretty soon as he spoke with a certain air of knowledge he buttoned a sou'wester strap high under his chin say i bet i know laughed paul eyeing billy then fred carefully what demanded dudley we're going to stuff a bear for the mishi makwa game aren't we fred right you are we will if elizabeth will help us with the sewing of the burlap replied fred oh is that why you picked over that iron junk in belfast and bought all those sharp-ended rods for spear points added paul when can we make it and have our first game asked billy the sooner we get started the sooner we will have the bear finished and the rest depends upon that replied fred 
When Uncle Tom heard about the project, he willingly donated the burlap bags and hay. Trixie, very curious as she stood in the drizzle in her check skirt, begged the boys to tell her all about the bear spearing game. "'You're going to be invited to the next council, and then you'll see how to do it,' replied Billy. "'When will that be?' asked Trixie. "'Next Thursday afternoon at three o'clock,' said Fred. "'And then the honor of the black bears will be upheld,' declared Billy. "'Now what do you mean by that?' again asked Trixie. "'Just come to the council and find out,' was all Billy would say. "'But Fred explained. "'You see, Billy and I really belong to the black bear tribe when we are home. "'So we are going to challenge all of the members of the Pentagoet tribe here "'and the visitors to a bear-spearing contest. "'You can join the others if you like and try to beat our score.' Trixie followed the boys to the shore and waved farewell until they were out of sight in the misty morning. Then she sat on the steps, oblivious alike of her damp skirt and the drops of moisture that sparkled on her curls, longing for a camp life and the simple fun of the woodcrafters. Finally she realized she was becoming thoroughly wet from the fine rain, so she went dolefully back to the house. At Sunset Island all hands watched Fred construct the bear. He found he would not need Elizabeth's help for the sewing, as his practice with sailor's palm and needle came in good, even if the stitches were uneven. What a ludicrous creature it was when completed! A loop of rope for a tail, another for a nose, and a third on the middle of the back. Billy and Paul helped to swing the beast from between two tall birches, and Dudley took the first fling of a spear at it. Dudley had occupied himself in trimming into a wooden spear one of the small, standing dead firs that crowded the underbush of the island. This gave Fred an idea. Say, boys, each one of you can make a lot of those kind of spears, and we might use them for practice. That's right, the old bear will last longer than if we used the iron spears on him, added Billy. As night came on, the fog shut in again and Fred called the boys from their spear-making to look after their tents for the night. That evening the bungalow fire made a cheery spot to gather about, for the dampness out of doors was chilly and unfriendly. "'Do you think it will be foggy all day tomorrow? asked Dudley. "'I don't think so, but we mustn't kick if it is, as we have had fine weather right along,' replied Fred. "'I know of a fine game to play in foggy weather,' hinted Mrs. Remington. Instantly she had everyone's attention, as she knew she would. The wood boxes need a new supply, and so many valiant woodcrafters about here ought to be valiant woodchoppers for a change, said she. Oh, Piffle, what a game, sniffed Paul. The others all laughed at his disgusted look, but Fred said, We'll do it, Mother. Of course it's a great sacrifice of valuable time, but we would throw it away recklessly for you. I am happy to have such generosity shown me, seeing that I am the only one who ever sits before the big fireplace, laughed Mrs. Remington, as she seldom had time to sit down with the others when they told stories and played games before the great fire. The children appreciated the sarcasm, and the following morning every available container was filled full of chopped wood. The morning was foggy, so the wood boxes attended to, the boys fished off the float stage for lobster bait. Sculpins and flounders were caught, and by this time the mist began lifting. The captain thought they might row out to the traps to bait them, and before the last lobster trap was baited and heaved over the side of the boat, the sun shone out. A little breeze from the west soon scattered the remaining curls of fog, and the day turned out to be dazzlingly bright. For all their patient working, the boys found nothing but crabs and starfish in the traps that morning and they began to fear that the lobster supply around Sunset Island had been exhausted. I'll tell you what we've got to do. We've got to change the traps and put them over towards the Isleboro side, said Dudley. I saw a lot of trap buoys over that way. Don't you know those fishermen would gladly set their traps here, if it wasn't for us being on the island, asked Billy? And the captain added, Bill's right, and some of these men say they're going to come and set their traps here anyway. You'd think that all the refuse from fish that we've been throwing out from our fish-drying work would have attracted the lobsters long ago, wouldn't you? ventured Billy. They're queer critters, all right, admitted Captain Ed. I guess it will be clear for the bear-spearing tomorrow after all, Paul said, looking at the blue sky. 
I'll finish my last iron spearhead tonight and be all ready for it, added Fred. Supper over that evening, Fred worked on the spearhead while the other boys tried various ways of tying knots. As the captain was a master hand at that craft, he was appealed to, and when the boys had been taught to tie some sailor knots, he showed them several trick knots which caused great interest. Then Mrs. Remington showed them how to do the string trick called throwing the fish spear. The following day was clear and sunny, and the usual attendance at council was counted upon by the islanders, but they were in for a surprise. When the guests began to arrive, a number of strange launches were seen in the wake of the Orion. It was then learned that neighboring cottagers of Aunt Edith's had heard of the fun and entertainment provided at a woodcraft council, and had begged permission to be invited to the next one held on Sunset Island. A hearty welcome was extended the visitors, and the council opened. When the tally of the last council was read, the guests laughed at the account of the poetry contest. Then came the call for report of scouts. Billy saluted. Oh, chief, I have to report that being desirous of obtaining a photograph of a young fish hawk or osprey in a nest on Spruce Island, I climbed the tree carrying Paul's Kodak on my back. I found the young osprey dead, hanging dismembered upon a branch below the nest. I could not determine whether this was due to an accident or not. Evidently the bird had been dead some time. I found the tails of seven flounders in and about the nest, also the remnants of other fish. I also found a piece of bamboo netting woven into the nest. I managed to climb above and snap a photograph of the nest and dead bird, but I regret to say that it was a failure. The film was returned with nothing but blurs on it, so I think I made a mistake in focusing properly. A discussion ensued over the possible cause of the death of the osprey, and the suggestion of accident was decided to be the plausible one. Uncle Tom made a report on the presence of porcupines in his apple orchard and asked the help of some brave hunter to help exterminate them. Billy instantly volunteered and was accepted, providing he came alone. Mr. Charlton knew that Billy was perfectly trustworthy with firearms, but accidents can easily happen when a number of boys are taken along. Oh, chief, I have an offer to lay before the parents and guardians here present. I will train the boys in target shooting and offer a prize to that one who excels at a given time, now added Uncle Tom. How, how, echoed around the council ring at this news. The vote was unanimous on the part of the younger faction, so Fred put it to a motion. Oh, chief, I move that a committee be formed of parents to deliberate over this plan, said Mrs. Remington. Second the motion, added Mrs. Farwell. On the final vote, the motion was carried that the mothers form a committee to report later, not necessarily to the council, but to Uncle Tom or Fred. The time devoted to the granting of honors now arrived, and Elizabeth sprang to her feet. Oh, chief, I have a claim to present in behalf of another. Present the claim, said Widda Tonkin with dignity. In behalf of Widda Tonkin of the Black Bear tribe, I, Paleo of the Ompamwamas tribe, claim low honor for constructing a bear for the bear-spearing game according to the standards in the Book of Woodcraft edition of 1915, stated Elizabeth. Witnessed by Edward Blake, Dudley West, and William Remington, concluded she, proudly looking at her brother Fred. This was indeed a surprise to Fred, as he really had forgotten that his recent work on the bear constituted and counted for a coup. Nevertheless, he announced, as usual, you have heard this claim. It is properly witnessed, and moreover will soon be demonstrated at this council. What is your pleasure? The decision was unanimous for granting the coup, and the visitor's attention was drawn to the burlap bear swinging between the trees, just beyond the council ring. Then the chief announced, Friends and members of the Pentagoet tribe, you may not know that Chingibis and I are old woodcraft Indians of the honorable tribe of Black Bear. Today we wish to appear as Black Bears in our allegiance and introduce some of the customs of our tribe. One of these is the challenging for scalps. Each Black Bear wears a black scalp lock when he is in council. Here is mine, and Widda Tonkin held aloft a long strand of black horsehair 
with a loop of thong attached. This represents our life. When we challenge for scalps, we stake our life. If we lose, we have to remain dead until the tribe boats us alive again. Advancing to the council fire, Witta Tonkin, in the name of Shingebis and himself, challenged the Pentagoet tribe, or any visitors present, to a bear-spearing contest for scalps. Paul jumped up and cried, We accept, and a chorus of howls showed that everyone present was brave and daring. Oh, chief, how can we pay up if we have no hirsute ornaments similar to the black bear scalps? asked Uncle Bill. Everyone who enters this contest must agree to forfeit a scalp like this or similar. They can be procured, sternly answered Witta Tonkin. A babble of voices then arose, and finally it appeared that Witta Tonkin and Shingebis had twenty opponents arrayed against them in the contest. Gee, if the black bears win, we won't be able to see them. They will be so covered with scalps, cried Dudley. Oh, chief, that reminds me. What happens should the two black bears lose? How can two scalps be divided among so many pentagoets? inquired Uncle Tom. Why, we each get a lock of hair from their two heads, laughed Uncle Bill. I should say not. We each have one life to lose, and we give what we have. One life apiece, retorted the chief. Then who will get your two scalps, persisted Uncle Tom. No one. The black bears will get yours, boasted Fred. Everyone laughed at that, but the chief added seriously, Our two scalps, should we lose, will become the possession of the two braves opposing, who make the highest scores of individual hits out of the five shots allowed each contestant. That was plain and just, so they all filed over to the burlap bear. What a fight that was! The children and inexperienced spearsmen were soon cleared off of the field of action. Paul made a hit, but it counted for little, as it was not near the red-painted heart of the bear. Dudley scored in the same manner. Elizabeth hit the bear twice, but alas, only one spear stuck in, so she only scored once. Then they all shouted for a black bear. Shingebis stepped forward to try his skill. The bear was swung erratically but impartially by Captains Ed and Benton. Billy chose his time well and took careful aim. Two of his spears dangled from the bear's body, one in the very rim of the heart circle, thus counting ten for his score, and the other counting five, making a total of fifteen for his side. How, how, shouted a chorus of voices. For the honor of the black bear, said Billy solemnly. Now watch your Uncle Bill, cried that worthy, and kerplunk went a spear. It struck the ground below the clumsy beast. Everyone yelled, but Uncle Bill had four more trials. In these he netted his side fifteen, which, with the three hits of Elizabeth, Paul, and Dudley, totaled the Pentagoets, eighteen against fifteen of the black bears. Uncle Tom now tried, and amid great excitement, made a hit near the heart circle, counting five. Hurrah! shouted Paul, dancing wildly about. Twenty-three for our side, yelled Dudley, throwing a rock out to sea in order to give vent to his pent-up frenzy. Beat it, Witta Tonkin, for the honor of the black bears, urged Billy anxiously. Never fear, spoke the island chief with confidence. Have I speared the bear at Windy Ghoul and at Lake Pequo for naught? And his boast proved good. The three hits made by Witta Tonkin raised the black bear score, first to sixteen, then to twenty-one, and finally to thirty-one. Scalp, scalp, let's dance the scalp dance, screamed Billy shrilly with overwrought nerves. How, how, came from the others as they participated. Now pay up your scalps, ordered Fred. But this is a serious matter. Here, all you pentagoets and visitors. Don't you know we're all dead ones, cried Uncle Bill in a sepulchral tone. Thereupon, without further warning, he fell to the ground, dragging Edith, Miriam, and Paul down with him in the death struggle. The other losers of scalps failed to realize their demise in such a dramatic manner, and contented themselves with laughing heartily at Uncle Bill and his three wriggling understudies. "'Where can we procure scalps?' asked Aunt Edith. "'Why, at any harness store. 
get the horsehair dingle dangles that we use as a substitute for the black bear brand replied elizabeth laughingly i'm going to get a bright red one to show my heart's blood exclaimed paul then you'd better get another to use after the tribe votes you alive again advised billy all right then i'll get a blue one for that as there were so many dead indians about the council of the living reconvened and voted the dead hunters alive again bill was sent out to bring them in and then the council closed by singing the zuni sunset song every one stood in a semicircle facing the red glow beyond the western mountains the light fading perceptibly as they sang from the launches that bore away the visitors the good-byes floated back to the group on shore and loud and long was the chorus that came from trixie and the islanders on the float stage for the girl had been invited to remain and visit elizabeth for a few days and the young people were all delighted to have her with them the weather was very unsettled for the next few days but that did not interfere with trixie's enjoyment she sailed with fred fished with the others and entered into all of the island sports with an energy that quite won the admiration of the boys say trix are you going to wear that check skirt again to-day i bet that's what hoodoos the weather said bill one morning seeing that the sun failed to shine yes i am then we'll postpone our walk on isleboro for every time you wear that skirt it rains continued fred teasingly how ridiculous nothing of the kind if you just try another skirt for our sakes i bet the sun will shine asserted dudley who saw the look exchanged between fred and bill well i don't believe in signs and hoodoos but to please you boys i will wear my short corduroy skirt and it's better anyway for walking through the woods admitted trixie the boys knew it would be a fine day and the mist that hid the sun would soon be dispelled so they chuckled to themselves that trixie would believe it was her change of skirt the walk on islesboro was for the purpose of completing the tree and flower coup of the pentagoet tribe and incidentally the sail over to crow cove would be enjoyable and add mileage to fred's sailing how many miles have you made now fred asked paul just one hundred and one miles oh he'll do it all right said dudley i intend to said fred quietly let's sail over to the old rack laughed billy in imitation of maine sailors maybe there will be enough water under her stern so's we can sail close under and climb aboard if you want to suggested fred this met with approval for everyone wanted a good chance to see what a dead eye was and this was an old timer though everything removable had long since been taken the rows of dead eyes stuck up along her sides empty for years of the shrouds they formerly secured what queer names things on boats have commented trixie you will admit that dead eyes are appropriate in their connection with shrouds laughed elizabeth i never thought of that chuckled billy and why is that rope you are holding called a sheet wondered trixie because it is fastened to a corner of a sail replied fred sheet came from the old word meaning something that stuck out or shot out shoot and shot are related words you know and as corners stick out a corner of the sail was first called a sheet line and then the name was applied to the line itself leading from the corner well where did you find all that out said his sister surprised in the encyclopedia you see i too thought the name a queer one so i looked it up maybe sheets for a bed were called that because they had corners ventured paul yes the book thinks so returned fred and the big anchor that was depended upon for safety was called a sheet anchor not because it had corners but because it was shot out into the water the whole word means a mix-up of things but all we need remember is that the sheet here is the line and not the sail i brought my camera to take a picture of the wreck said paul as they saw the vessel wait until i get on her and then take me too will you paul asked billy eagerly of course he will billy and we will name it the two wrecks laughed dudley when the mariners were once more sailing the seas paul remarked i wonder if trix knows the sun is shining why so it is cried the girl see there we told you that checked skirt was the hoodoo teased fred 
Don't tell me you believe it would have rained had I worn it, scoffed Trixie. Why not? It brought rain every other day, laughed Billy. Pooh! Elizabeth told me that today promised fair, so I know you were only trying to tease me. The walk through the woods was enjoyed by all, and the boys were delighted to find that they could add enough trees to their lists to make the twenty-five required for a coup. With beech, mountain ash, aspen poplar, white cedar, and three kinds of birches, and moose-leaf maple, to add to the fir, spruce, and pine found on Sunset Island, they were able to finish their collection, begun with chestnut, catalpa, and various oaks found in more southerly latitudes. That evening, as Fred read aloud the list of trees for a grand coup, Elizabeth, the poetess, turned them into rhyme. Trixie watched her scribble, and when through, took it and read it aloud to the circle in the living room. The grand coup for trees. I want to know the trees that grow. They're interesting, you see. Besides, a woodcraft honor high it may bring now to me. Don't blame the dogwood for this verse, though doggerel it be. Its flowers are much more beautiful than any lines from me. I'd like to tell you all about the trees, both great and small. T'would keep me very busy to even name them all. The pine tree, that fine tree, the elms and the oaks, make wood enough and good enough for any sort of folks. The beech tree, the peach tree, together on the strand, the pretty girls the peaches love, the beaches shining sand, the palm tree, the balm tree, the bamboo, the teak, and others from the Orient, if we go there to seek the orange tree whose blossoms be much loved on wedding days the lemon and the grapefruit too are kin in many ways the apple and the apricot the plum tree and the pear the fruits of these are sure to please somebody anywhere the cedar and the hemlock the fir and pine and spruce are members of one family with wood for any use the cottonwood the willow for canoes and indian beds the aspen and the poplar that rustles o'er our heads, the hickory, the walnut, the pecan now are all nut-bearers in the autumn to feed us in the fall. Mulberry trees, wild cherry trees, the mango and the date, the last, you see, must be the tree that keeps some men out late. The sycamores, yes, by the scores, they line the river's brim. We know these trees afar with ease by mottled bark and limb. Persimmon and the chinquapin sound good and nice and sweet. We one and all late in the fall enjoy their fruits to eat. The china berry is a very charming flowering tree. It grows down south in spite of drought. Up north it cannot be. Pendant locust blooms look good. The tree is fine for shade. For posts that last, tis better wood than any other made. The butternut, the chipmunk's friend, the wood is soft and dark. We know it by its frond-like leaves as well as by its bark. The maple is a staple tree, its syrup very sweet. Its wood is good for floors, you see. In its shade we like to meet. The hazel bush might raise a blush if called a tree, tis true. The rhyme is fierce, but in a rush we stop at naught, do you? The chestnut is the best nut, its wood is very good. Tis easy to split and easy cut, the nuts are good for food. The basswood's wood is fine for trunks, when bound with duck or leather. Saw up tree trunks in boards, not chunks, and fasten them together. The elder and the alder much delight in swamps to grow. The cedar also likes the touch of water at its toe. The sweet gum and the cypress are in Dixie's forests found. Live oaks, their mossy beards hang far to cane breaks on the ground. The evergreen and long-leafed pine lift high their spreading arms. Spring now endows their plumy spines with new and pleasing charms. In May, old dark green needles show a bushy background there while new light shoots up standing, grow like Christmas candles flare. Of beauty out of doors in spring, of trees like these and more, 
of flowers and birds that mate and sing old earth has still full store end of chapter ten